the cycling podcast in association with Rafa. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Uh, up there in sunny Watford. Not Watford. And Daniel Freib. Freiber. Freiber. Daniel Freiber. Daniel Freiber. Ah, I'm glad. I'm glad 18 months of living with Rob Hatch has served some <laughs> useful purpose. <laughs> It's the return of the pronunciation police, <laughs> putting me in my place. There, <laughs> excellent. Uh, yeah. Well, how are you, how are you how are you both chaps? Strong, very well, thank you. Very strong, very strong. Snowing here, Rich. Snowing in Berlin. You're in the uh, Berlin office of the Cycling Podcast. Um, we are going to be talking mainly about Milan San Remo in this episode. It was a a race that a lot of people enjoyed, I think, and uh, a significant winner in Vincenzo Nibali. Um, so we'll. we'll dedicate most of the episode to that uh, but before we get on with that Lionel can we crack on with the news roundup please we certainly can Rich yes it was in a, a weekend of impressive solo breaks wasn't it Vincenzo Nibli won Milan San Remo making it back-to-back -back monument victories for him because he won in Lombardia at the end of last season uh, in the women's race the Trofeo Alfredo Binder on Sunday Cassia Nuvodoma of Poland won uh, with a similarly impressive break going around 10 kilometers from the end uh, Mi Milan San Remo was all about Nibali we'll talk about that in um, the bulk of this episode but just a couple of things just in case we don't mention them later on um, it was uh, the first Italian victory since Filippo Pozzato in 2006 in Milan San Remo so um, no wonder the Italians were were cock a hoop after the finish uh, the big sprinters were all Peacock a hoop. Peacock a hoop, of course. They're peacock of Sandrigo. The um, Sandrigo is it? Sandrigo. 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 There's a chapter by Chiro in our book, the Cycling Podcast book, a journey through the cycling year, all about Pozzato. Almost a love letter to Pozzato. Not sure whether that. No, one... almost about it. Well, yeah, almost, it's almost like, a yeah. sex text, more like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, oh my word! Not sure whether that entices people to buy the book or not. Um, it's, uh, but it's a, it's a lovely piece. Um, yeah. So Italy's long wait for a Milan San Remo winner again uh, is is over and uh, Nibali timed his move absolutely perfectly uh, an attack on the Poggio we'll talk all about that later on the other uh, notable events from the race Marcel Kittel was dropped on the Capo Berta and then dropped really for good on the Cipressa uh, not uh, not a race for him I'd speculated last week that where, about whether or not um, Milan San Remo would be for him this year clearly not Mark Cavendish had a really bad looking crash around 10 kilometres to go as they were heading towards the Poggio um, traffic island in the middle of the road nobody seemed to be there with a with a flag uh, clearly didn't see it um, and, and went right over the top of it and, and the sort of disturbing aspect of it was his shoe was left on the top of the bollard um, you know he'd gone head over heels was that, was that the most disturbing well, aspect well it just of it? showed the force of the impact to me that kind of brought him mm. out. obviously seeing him you know in the fetal position on the floor was distressing enough but um yeah i think it brings it home to you you know the force of the crash and the way he hit that bollard true took his shoe off um there was also a crash for andre greipel um he will miss the rest of the classics as a result um but the the it was all about nibley's move and we'll discuss um, how brilliant that was and uh, the, the you know what went on behind uh, later on the women's race the Trofeo Alfredo Binder was held in uh, pretty grim conditions cold and wet and Nuvodoma went with around 10 kilometers to go looked very strong on the climb and very strong on the flat and uh, really opened up the gap well and won convincingly uh, Chantal Black and Mariana Voss made it two Dutch riders on the podium if anyone's wondering why it's called the Trofeo Alfredo Binder well Alfredo Binder was an Italian rider uh, who won the Giro five times was he the I think the first rider to win the Giro five times um, he was racing from the sort of the early 20s to the mid 30s um, he also won Milan San Remo twice, and he's from uh, Citilio. Is that right, Daniel? Is that the pronunciation? Citilio. No, that's Citilio. Citilio. No, Citilio. 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 
Good. Where's Rob Hatch when you need him? <laughs> well, he uh, yeah. So that's where the that's where the race is held. Um, anyone of sort of our generation, Rich, will probably remember uh, Binder toe straps. Which um, anyone wondering what toe straps are, uh, they were what we had before before we had clipless <laughs> clipless pedals. When you had to oh, strap your foot to the pedal, it seems seems uh, like another world away now. But uh, yeah, a little bit of history there. And actually, was Sean Kelly not the last man to win a classic with toe straps? Milan San Remo. Oh, that's a good question. I'd have to look at the pictures, but yeah, I think you're probably right. He didn't transfer over until really, really. I think at the he end. was using toe. I think he's using toe clips and straps when he won Milan San Remo. So we've just done a some, completed some kind of circle there. Yeah. The other notable thing about that Milan San Remo '92 was that he was paid an awful lot of money to wear a Brancali helmet which was an, the ugly whatever he was paid it wasn't well enough. it was an ugly looking thing but he only went back to get it from the car with about sort of 40 kilometers to go he didn't want to wear it all day he didn't have to wear a helmet um racing in italy in those days um but yeah it looked like a looked like an upturned pudding bowl but um clearly the clearly the money was worth it um in other racing the tour of catalonia is underway as we speak the first stage uh, has been run off and won by Alvaro Hodeg. Hodge, Hodge, Alvaro Hodge, Alvaro Hodge. Well, a, a, a timely intervention there from the pronunciation police. No, um, Alvaro, no relation Alvaro Hodge. of the England 1980s midfielder Steve Hodge. We should point out, <laughs> or, Steve, or Steve, or Stephen Hodge, the old Festina rider, mm. Australian, mm. for that matter. That'd be more likely, wouldn't it? A cyclist, um, but uh, well, he's Scottish, as we know, oh, now know. Oh. Ali, Ali, Ali Hodge, <laughs> Ali Hodge, did you? Uh, Hodge, Hodge on the march, on the march with Ali's army, <laughs> eh? <laughs> I, I would have loved it I would have loved it if when he was interviewed after winning the Hands Am Classic whether if he just opened his mouth in a broad Glaswegian <laughs> accent <laughs> well tell the story I Rich. know that yeah well I don't, I'm not, it's only sort of dribbling out and, and it was actually Rob Hatch that alerted me to this because he was commentating on uh, the Hands Am Classic on Friday on Eurosport and he pronounced the name as you did, Lionel Hodeg, and he then uh, was sent some messages from I don't know whether Spanish speaking or Colombian uh, viewers telling him that actually Alvaro, it's a, nobody had heard the name Hodeg, so he he pronounces it Hodge, and the the story seems to be that his grandfather was a Scottish fisherman who moved to Colombia, and the name perhaps was was misspelt when he got there, so the um, the the G and the E were put the wrong way around, so Hodge became Hodeg, uh, but he pronounces it Hodge. And uh, yeah, I mean, well, welcome aboard, uh, Ali. Well, um, well, are the, if, are the still, Scots still already? Are, that you were saying still, earlier, Rich, the Scots are already trying to sign him up for the Commonwealth Games. Stick, put a kilt on him. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, I mean, I think moves are afoot to try and get him signed up for the Commonwealth Games. I imagine that would go down well with Patrick Lefebvre at Quick Step. Well, it's about, well, what, it, is it, what is this Commonwealth Games? Who cycles in this Commonwealth Games? He's about as Scottish as Mark O. Pantani was Irish. <laughs> But on a serious uh, note, on a serious note, whether he's Scottish or Colombian, uh, he looks he's like definitely Scottish. he looks like a, a, a little clear. sensation. You know, quick step lost Fernando Gaviria for Milan San Remo um, w- w- through injury after his crash, and uh, in in the space of a week, Hodge has won the Hans Zimmer Classic and a stage of the Tour of Catalonia, and uh, clearly looks like a, an, another talent. And I. Th- Going back to um, talking to Patrick Lefebvre about how he spots riders, I mean, it sounds obvious, but he did say at the Vuelta, didn't he, last year, or oh, have eyes everywhere? Well, well. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly has. Well, Napalm, quick step. I mean, people might be wondering how come they've got two these two prodigious Colombian riders. Um, they did actually employ uh, a very well-known talent scout Fernandez Machin for a couple of years he's actually left now and he's reunited with Mara Genetti at the UAE team but Machin um, had been a direct sport even Mape Sonia de Val various other teams and he was being used by Quickstep as a talent scout particularly focusing on the sort of Hispanic market for a couple of years and um, yeah he's come up trumps with uh, Hodge 
and Gaviria, hasn't he? Um, I don't know if you saw the sprint yesterday in C- Catalonia, but I think the technical term for uh, the sprint that old Hodge pulled out is absolutely mustard. <laughs> <laughs> It was. It was a very, very fast finish, wasn't it? Michael Merku as well has been a good signing for a quick step. He did a great job. Um, and, I mean, yeah, he rinsed it, didn't he, to use another technical term. He absolutely rinsed it super fast. And uh, he does look extremely, extremely talented. Uh, poor old Gaviria will be, you know, feeling a little bit... It's, it's an amazing team for that, isn't it? You had... Gaviria coming through while Kittel was still there. And, you know, they've got just got this conveyor belt of talent there. Indeed. But shall we turn our attentions back to Milan San Remo, the big race of the weekend, first monument of the season, kind of the beginning of the classics. Um, not really much in common between Milan San Remo and, and the cobbled classics, to be honest. But um, what were your thoughts? Well, it was, as ever, a really fascinating, fascinating race because, as everybody says, it's an easy race to finish, relatively speaking, but a very, very hard race to win. And... You know, when you've got, uh, you know, Vincenzo Nibali, a, a, a guy that we know from the Grand Tours, winning Grand Tours, and he's, he's won all three, um, winning ahead of Caleb Ewan, you know, a pure sprinter, that tells you everything really about Milan San Remo, doesn't it? Because it's it's one of the only races where guys like that can go head to head. I mean, Caleb Ewan rode a, a very good race. His teammate, you mentioned, uh, Tr- Matteo Trentin, uh, put in a, a bit of a a bid to try and catch Nibali and it looked at one point like he might do it and then you'd have fancied Trenton in the sprint didn't work out and I think Caleb Ewan was maybe annoyed that Trenton didn't because it looked like the the Mitchelton Scott plan was very much to support Caleb Ewan he was surrounded by teammates for a lot of the race and they did a really good job and Trenton perhaps went uh, off script going after Nibali in the way that he did. I think it was a typical move, Rich, of a guy who's been sort of kept away in a, in his hutch or in his kennel for a few years working for um, more decorated riders, more famous riders, and Trenton has been desperate to, to get off the leash. And the first opportunity he's had in a big race um, was Sam Raymond on, on Saturday. And yeah, it, it's difficult to know, you know what the instructions were from the DS, but... You know, Milan San Remo is a really, really fascinating race because it, it hinges on these tiny, um, these these tiny factors, these tiny variables. And you know, we've talked certainly last year and I think the year before. I talked a lot about hesitation and the role it plays in San Remo and and how you know moments hesitation will always affect the outcome in Milan San Remo. And um, you know the. One of the factors that definitely, I think, played a role in Nibali staying away was Trentin going away. Um, you know, both in terms of the help um, that that Ewan didn't get, but also in the effect that had on the on the bunch. And you know, similarly with Nibali's attack, Nibali launched the attack when his Bahrain Merida team were were on the front, and he launched it in uh, uh, on a part of the Poggio where well, it was a bit earlier than we usually see attacks in Milan San Remo. So was, there was a moment's hesitation there, both because Bahrain were on the front and no one, well, everyone was sort of taking a few seconds to organise their chase, and also because they didn't expect the, the attack to come then. And then there was also the Latvian rider, um, Chris Nylans or Nylans, um, was up the road um, at that time. And he was also essential. But all of these things probably made a second or two seconds difference. And and that is why Milan San Remo is so fascinating because that ultimately um, was the difference between Nibali staying away and getting caught. I mean, Milan San Remo is uh, the only classic, I think, that you was, you sort of analyse with a microscope rather than a telescope. The other the other monuments, Flanders and, and Lombardy particularly and Liège, they, the, the narratives kind of play out with these sort of planetary rhythms you know things happen quite slowly there's a chance to correct mistakes and and that's simply not the case with Milan San Remo um there was a good phrase that one of the Italian journalists Cristiano Gatti used on uh, on Sunday in his analysis of the races he said it's seven hours of the grind of modern life and a 15 minute electrocution at the end and that's kind of what it felt like 
Well, on, on that point, really, I was just going to ask Daniel, I mean, what you thought, because the way that Group Armour, FDJ, um, controlled things so well and looked really in control on the Cipressa, uh, Ignatus Konovalovas and uh, Matthew Ladon. Man, man, man of the match, well, I think. Yeah, he, was, he was fantastic. There's talk of talk about the headwind and, you know, the fact that it was a, relatively speaking, a slow ascent, but obviously, um, you know, the, the wind would have been responsible for that. But the fact that there was really, you know, nothing, nothing doing on the Cipressa, uh, you know that that almost kind of kept the 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 lid on the bottle um, for longer than perhaps we've seen. Normally, you see something kind of kick off a bit more on the Cipressa, don't we? But it all came down to really that one one moment. Really, there was really only one moment in in the race, and it and it was Nibali and the timing of it. You you would have thought was it was too far from the top, but um, actually that's exactly what he needed in order to open up that gap. And it really was a, a matter of seconds, wasn't it? Because if he'd gone over the top with just, you know, even three or four seconds less than he had, he wouldn't have had that in, um, advantage coming on to the, 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 the final running when it all flattens out. I, I mean, there's that, that, that moment where he went and the fact that he went after Nayland, who not a rider that people would have been perhaps looking out for. That was a, a, an amazing uh, performance from him. He he opened it up. He was the catalyst for Nibali to, to get away and... Uh, Nibali was away and I suspect in that moment a lot of people probably looked at Peter Sagan to to bring it back, to close it and Sagan had a couple of teammates with him at that point um, and he didn't and he perhaps, you know, uh, he, having been caught out like that before himself didn't want to fall into that trap and, and hesitated and and the race was done and uh, the defending champion Mihal Kwiatkowski said that he had a couple of goes but by then it was it was really too late and Nibali had had flown and uh, I mean we'll talk about Nibali I think more in the in the next part but you mentioned FDJ and Arno Demar another former winner he was third I I thought I, I thought that team was just incredibly impressive the way they the way they rode and I think back to the Tour de France last year when he was ill and there were two stages uh, in the Jura and in the Alps where he was off the back and eventually eliminated on the stage into Chambry. And I remember him being surrounded by, um, I think, three or four teammates and same, same guys who were with him on, on Saturday in Milan San Remo, really, um, saying that they were, you know, that, that it was it was for love, you know, that there was this incredible bond between them. Um, and, you know, that the, the, they weren't acting on instructions from the team. They wanted to help DeMar get to the finish. And... I thought they rode on Saturday at Milan San Remo like that. Like there's an incredibly strong bond between them, and they were uh, absolutely committed to Demar. And you know he finished on the podium again. A, a good result. Nobody talks about it because everybody talks about Nibali. But I was very impressed by that team's performance. The other team that that really did try something, I guess you have to say, is Bora because uh, the German champion Marcus Burghardt, um, you know, went very hard at the bottom of the podio, got a gap at one point. Uh, Jean-Pierre Drucker of BMC was with him. They kind of did have a little bit of a gap. but um, And then later on, once Nibali had gone, Daniel Oss then was trying to um, you know drag things back together again for uh, Bora and for obviously for Peter Sagan. Um, didn't, didn't quite work. And I think that just, that again highlights just how uh, well-timed and well-executed Nibali's move was. Just a little, I don't want to be flippant about this issue at all, um, but given that last week we were talking about... Um, the Giro going to um, going to Israel and and you know I've I've written a little bit about this um, on on my soon to be defunct blog, um, but but <laughs> um, the, the the fact that you know we we talk about the the big issues of 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 the Giro going to um, Israel, but it was interesting to me that uh, Nayland's the the Latvian champion riding for the Israel Academy team. You know you could argue he almost set up Vincenzo Nibali riding for the Bahrain team. I mean. You know, there's quite an interesting juxtaposition there. I don't really want to sort of draw, extrapolate some great meaning from that, but um, you know, we we have we have teams sponsored by um, you know by Israel uh, and by Bahrain there, uh, cooperating or collaborating or or, or coexisting in the peloton. Um, and that was just a, a little moment that um, I don't that think I don't think, deli- I don't think it was deliberate. I don't think it was deliberate, though. No, I don't think it was. But was, I mean, uh, but you know, they're in the same bunch, aren't they? We, Daniel yeah, made yeah. the point last week about the peloton being a, a society on wheels, and 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 it is. You know, there's um, there's there's 
you know, room for everyone. And, and just the enemy, the enemy of my, oh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> and and just from a technical point of view, Lionel, I think the the contribution it was only about a two hundred meter contribution of Nylons was absolutely essential um, for for Nibali. You know, we talk so much these days, um, and and it's become an unfashionable term. But we talk so much about marginal gains, and and again, just to labour the point slightly, but that's what it really came down to on on Saturday. And you know, the fact that Nibali did attack really before everyone expected him to attack. Um, they weren't Sagan, Kvitkovsky, the guys who, and Gilbert to a certain extent, although he'd had problems before the Poggio, the guys who you would have expected to go with him weren't quite ready for it. There's a spot on the Poggio just after the church, just as you come into the village at the top, where everyone always attacks. And Nibali went well before that. And I think the fact that he was on his own ultimately actually helped him and it kind of surprises me that we don't see more solo attacks succeeding on the Poggio because you know that um, is is a great antidote to that hesitation which is fatal in in Milan San Remo when two or three riders together there is always a moment it might only be a second or a split second when they look at each other and they're trying to suss out who's the strongest in the group and that moment ultimately proves proves fatal for them in the end and um, whereas Nibali knew that he was not going to get any help knew, he knew that no one was going to catch him or that you know before the before the last kilometer and he just had to put his head down and go and that's what he did and uh, you know it was also vital I think you know talking about fine margins that um, he was actually hoodwinked slightly by his team car his direct sportif in the team car who told him that he had 20 seconds when in fact he had about 12 um, at the top but again you know um, races well like this, or particularly Milan San Remo, do come down to tiny details like that. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to our sponsor, Science in Sport, for continuing to back the Cycling Podcast. We're very you, grateful. You make it them. sound rich. Uh, you make it sound there as though we've been involved in some terrible public humiliation, and that in spite of that. <laughs> They've st- they've decided to stick by us through thick and thin. <laughs> well, there might uh, there might be some truth in that. I don't know, but well, they have. I mean, they they are they are backing us again this year, and they'll be their their support will help us to go to all three Grand Tours, starting with the Giro very soon. Uh, you can get twenty five percent off all your science of sport products at scienceofsport dot com with the code Lionel with the code. Oh no, I d- I can't remember. Daniel, Daniel, the code. I don't know. I'm, t- I'm too busy thinking about how the my mention of the Chiro Pozzato sex text might be precisely that public humiliation that science and sport might have to <laughs> stick by us through. I'm, I'm just testing there, chaps. Uh, SISCP25, SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Thank you, science and sport. Now, uh, we were going to talk in this bit about Nibali and, you know, a lot of, it seems to have elevated him uh, in the the discussion around Nibali to, you know, where does he belong in the pantheon? You know, he's now won all three Grand Tours. He'd, he'd won the Lombardia twice. He's now won another monument. You know, the, not many riders have won all three Grand Tours. Not many riders have won more than one monument. And I think we're wondering as well, what else can he win? He's gone fairly close or reasonably close in Liege, Baston Liege before. He has said that this year, he's riding the Tour de France this year, but he said that he's, you know, he was coming into this year looking at trying to win some of the the classics. And he's unusual, I suppose, in the sense of, of being at such an established GC rider who is also who races with panache and he's great he's good at winning you know he won a he won a memorable stage at the vuelta last year he won a, a good stage at the giro um and he's won stages at the at the tour de france of course as well he is not a conservative calculating sort of rider is he he he's he can be quite swashbuckling when he wants to be well certainly rich i would agree with that and um milan san remo in particular is I mean, it's a race that's much malign, maligned, and I saw people maligning the course um, even on Saturday, saying that you know it was boring. But that is kind of the point. And um, you know, people say it's a lottery. It is a lottery, not but not in the sense that people mean. I mean, people say that because they're suggesting that it's random that anyone can win. It is a lottery in the sense that it's almost impossible that that a guy like Nibali is going to win, but you can't call it impossible uh, as long as there is a tiny glimmer of hope. And, and, uh, you know, he ultimately latched onto that and grabbed that hope. And he, he had a winning ticket on, on 
Saturday. But I think it's really it was a really a victory of a testament to his will and how much Milan San Remo means to an Italian rider like Nibali. Because if you take out the sprinters, the guys who really should be winning Milan San Remo, there are probably fifteen or twenty guys in the Peloton who have physiological characteristics more suited to an attack on the Poggio and staying away. Um and yet Nibali has tried four times now on the Poggio and He's ultimately won a Milan San Remo. And I think he's done that through p- pure desire and pure will um, to to make it happen, um, to go against those odds. And, um, you know, that is, that's typical of the way he races. But as I said, I think it's typical also, or it says a lot about where he knows he now stands in the pantheon of professional cycling and Italian cycling and he also knows that no Italian cyclist can be considered completely fulfilled and their palmarès cannot be considered com- complete without a Milan San Remo because it is that important in Italian cycling and just to you know I wasn't there on Saturday but listening to people and looking at La Gazzetta dello Sport for example the next day you know they had seven pages on Milan San Remo every single article was about Nibali and they completely ignored the rest of the race and you know it did it, it, I uh, felt a bit uncomfortable actually reading it because it was a bit too gushing it was a bit too effusive um, you know they were calling him the pride of Italy and you know terms and a sort of tone of coverage that I think we should perhaps be be careful, or with the the the, the past has taught us to be to be careful about sort of lapsing into. But nonetheless, uh, as I say, um, it, it really does sort of crown him as as the prince of Italian cycling, and 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 puts him on a similar level to you know Coppi and and Binder and Girardengo and 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 those great names. And I think what what captures people's imagination, you know. It, Nibley's hardly an underdog, you know. He, he's a he's a champion, but to see him winning a race, as you say, against the odds like that, when you've got the the sprinters kind of poised and waiting, and with teammates around them, and and all the support that they need, in that scenario, in that context, Nibley is almost like a plucky underdog, and that makes the the win all the sweeter. And it's why sort of neutrals were probably rooting for him. And it's it's just interesting how this victory resonates so much more than you know winning the tour of lombardy which comes at the end of the season when a lot of riders have have switched off it's a it's a more selective kind of race and uh and one where where luck is less of a factor or timing or whatever you want to call it um and also i think because milan Sarin was the first of the season isn't it because it's the, the the big sort of opener the big the first big fixture on on the calendar i think that also uh just means that milan san remo resonates even more yeah, and I think the, the, the way the race pans out, um, you, you think, well, all these sprinters have won it down the years. You know, it's a sprinter's race. Um, you know, if you look at the last 30-odd years, it, 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 the number of sprinters have won it, it may, by many times outnumbers the number of times that even some, sort of small breaks have gone away. And then there's been the kind of the 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 the, the bolt from a cannon-type wins by Pozzato springs to mind, Cancellara springs to mind. Um but uh, the the fact that the, the sprinters don't have any help left um, is really telling, isn't it? And I think that just shows, that again, just shows how strong Nibali had to be um, to get away and, and get that gap because it, you'd, you'd think, convention would say, well, surely there's going to be two, three or four teammates, particularly a team like Quickstep or, or Group Armour, although, although Group Armour really sort of um, used up their strength a bit, a bit earlier in the race. Um, it just kind of shows you uh, how difficult it is to pull off what Nibali pulled off at the weekend, and uh, the 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 fact that he's been um, at such a level for coming up for a decade now. I mean, he was um, he was sixth in the two thousand and nine tour, and he, and he's still at the the top of his game now. I mean, that's uh, you know, he's not just it's not a not a surprise win either, is it? It's not it's not like he's uh, you know a, a bolt from the blue. He's been trying to win this race for. For, for many years and he's finally done it uh, Lionel and, and just on your point about the sprinters not having trains left or not having many riders left to help them at the end I mean that to me is what invalidates the the, the, the claim the clamour for the route to change I think it's still a fantastic race and it's still a fantastic route precisely for that reason um, that the attrition and the, the length of the race you know it's 300 kilometres does still make a difference in modern cycling um, you know, we see races nowadays or getting harder and harder or people wanting them to get harder and harder. But that 
three hundred kilometers is still very unusual. Well, it's unique in in modern cycling, and it still does make um, a, a huge difference. And and just on Nibali and his place in the pantheon. I mean, if we think in terms of a Palmares and and if a, a rider starting in his career and knowing roughly what kind of rider he's going to be and what what could he possibly win? Well, I think Nibali is nearing the point where his Palmares is almost complete. I mean, there's almost no one in the history of professional cycling I would say has had a, a complete Palmares. Even Eddie Merckx didn't win Paris Tour, for example. Um, the, the closest I think. To, to a rider who's really won everything they should have won or would have wanted to win um, in their careers it would be Paolo Bettini, I would say, who won two Worlds and Olympics. He won a Liège, a Lombardy, a San Remo, um, and Italian championships. And he he had, um, or he won stages in, in all three Grand Tours. Um, Nibali, I would suggest, is lacking a World Championships and a Liège. And beyond that, I mean, you could also, you could throw in a flesh while on, but that, race is not really perceived as being as prestigious as it once was and um you, you know I, I think that puts him in the very top bracket you know how close he is to really assembling a, a complete collection of races that um he could or, or would have wanted to win here's a question for you i mean he's riding the tour de france again this year but you have a sense almost that races like milan san remo maybe liege baston liege are are perhaps a higher priority. The World Championships this year too in Innsbruck could be one that really suits him. Um, would he rather, or would it be better for him to win another Grand Tour or to win a Liège or a World Championship? Well, I think uh, an, another Tour de France is a, is a, a several levels above um, winning, say, another Giro or an, another Vuelta. Um, but a world title would certainly... Uh, would would certainly be a welcome addition. I, I'm wondering about the Tour of Flanders because he's riding that for the first time um, this year. And uh, when I mentioned that before we started recording, Daniel said, well, how long is it since a 65 kilo guy won the Tour of Flanders? Which is a good point. I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, I just thought, well, you know, if he can win Lombardy, if he can win Milan San Remo, why not the, the Tour of Flanders? But it would be really fascinating to see how he gets on in uh, in that race because in terms of the in terms of the climbing that's no problem at all but in terms of having the the oomph and the grunt to um, to get over the climbs with the you know the, the real specialists that would you know that's a question that we may see answered well the the um, last one napalm um was michele bartoli another italian in 1996 wasn't it a very very similar build to nibali not quite as tall but the same weight sort of 64 65 um kilograms but more of a well he was a classic specialist wasn't he but um yeah morphologically pretty similar but um you know the climbing is the climbing per se is not going to be a problem uh, and the 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 race craft I mean Nibali lacks experience and he, he doesn't know the rows um but having said that we've sort of purred in the past when we've watched him in those couple of cobbled stages at the Tour de France we've absolutely marveled at how how loose and, and agile he is on a bike and and how he's found gaps and and you know he's gone he's, he's ridden down gutters and to avoid trouble and so forth um I would suggest it's probably not going to be enough for him to contend and it's probably late in his career to start thinking about you know building up enough experience to be able to contend in the next two or three years um but I think he might surprise us um you know there are there are a number of Grand Tour riders who are talking about doing some races on the cobbles um, in the next few weeks. I think Quintana's going to do one or two. Lander, I saw today, is going to do. Harold Becker. And with those guys, I think we'll see them, you know, pull out after 120, 150 kilometers. With Nibali, it wouldn't shock me if, if you know, he's up there on the Koppenberg or not too far from the front um, in the Tour of Flanders so after 200 kilometers or more. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much to our main sponsor, Rafa, for supporting us through thick and thin. Just before you say it, Daniel, very grateful to Rafa and Science and Sport. And uh, and very grateful to you as well, the listeners who have signed up as friends of the podcast. You also help us to get to races and uh, in particular the three grand tours with our daily coverage beginning at the Giro soon 
We have a new friend special to release. It'll be coming out later this week, I think. Which one's this, Rich? Is this your trip to Belgium to see the next generation? The next generation. That could be the title. Oh, there we are. Lionel. Yeah. Um, well, it's um, yeah. I, I went to East Flanders recently and stayed a few nights with. Tim Harris and Jocelyn Ryan. Tim Harris, a former British professional, of course. Some of you may be familiar with him. Um, national national road race he, champion in... He was national race champion. 1989? He rode f- yeah, and he rode for an early uh, incarnation of the Festina team. He rode in Portugal quite a lot should, as well. Tim, Tim Harris seems to me like the kind of guy who should have an absolutely belting nickname. Well, that's your we job, We need to come Daniel, up with one, don't we? Yeah, he, he now runs a chair business, um, but he's lived in Belgium since he retired. And for f- about 15 years now, he and Jocelyn have uh, had a house nearby in Tilt Wing, where Eddie Merckx was born, as you'll know, Daniel. And Really? He, uh, yeah. Different. So, uh, next door to, n- uh, next village. Well, yeah. yeah near. Close, okay. close. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a statue there. I went to see the statue of Eddie Merckx. Um, but yeah, they, they have a big house there, which uh, is the home every year to um, between six and 10 or 12 young riders who are aspiring to turn professional. Uh, they, they take in riders every year, a lot of them funded by the Dave Rayner Fund. Um, and they've had, they've I mean, the, the, the riders they've had through that house is a who's who of professional cycling, really, from Mark Cavendish. Uh, to most recently Fernando Gaviria who actually lived in their own house uh, nearby uh, Dan McClay lived in their own house as well Adam Blythe, Lizzie Armitstead um, but lots of lots of writers a lot of British writers but a lot from elsewhere as well they've got an amazing book with all the and Chris Froome spent a year there as well um, so they've got an amazing sort of visitor book with uh, messages and signatures and photos and so on so I went over there spent a few days with them um, spoke to them about what they do how they do it and also met some of the young riders uh, who have uh, entered the house this year. It is very. It does feel a bit like Big Brother, although they don't get voted out. And the, we've actually left uh, left a couple of them uh, tasked with keeping audio diaries for the year. So we hope at the end of the year to release an episode or episodes covering their year of trying to turn pro. But this first episode will go out this week, and it it will be the whole story behind. The House, the Tim Harris and Justin Ryan story, and also an interview with uh, John Barkley, who is 88 years old now, and for over 40 years, he's been taking young riders across to Belgium to race pretty much every weekend, and he's still doing it now. Uh, a fascinating character, and again, the list of riders he's taken to Belgium is, is a who's who, really. So, really interesting, um, you know, Points of view, experiences, stories from people that we don't maybe hear enough of and uh, they, they perform a very vital role. Let's hear a little story now, a little clip from the episode. This is uh, Tim Harris uh, telling us his favourite memory of Fernando Gaviria. The best story I've got about um, Fernando is, so basically we went out for the day and we came back and we got a pretty big lawn, as you've seen, and the lawn was mowed. So Fernando Rivera had just mowed the lawn, so he'd never really seen a lawnmower before. He'd, he'd just spent the day doing the lawn. So not one cyclist out of anybody else ever would have dreamt of going into the garage, looking at the lawnmower, getting the lawnmower and doing the grass. And then he, and then I came in, he didn't mention it. I, did, I, I said, what have you been up to? I think he'd seen me do it the week before. And yeah. he thought, ooh, I fancy it. That, like that machine looks good. So... <laughs> You know, things like that. And then he wanted to play football in the garden. So it was like... It was just, we all had to go and play football. We had football. to go and play football. Five-a-side football, except with three of us. <laughs> or four of us. And if there was nobody there, you were not there once, once. He just went outside by himself and did keep the uppie. Yeah. Uh, by himself. So... so no one to play with. Well, Rich, that was Tim. I was expecting to hear, Fernando is in the diary room. After your, <laughs> after after you comparing it to Big Brother. Well, funnily enough, mm. I was going to suggest it. I've solved cycling's problems using social media. Why don't they have a stage race where the public vote riders out after each stage? They could vote and they can vote whoever they want out, and then the winner 
at the end of the race is uh, a combination of the the strongest and and most popular. It could be an absolute game changer. I think that's the worst. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Lionel, I think Lionel, I think you need to give it a rest with the. The, the gimmicky suggestions. I was speaking to someone very high up in the Abu Dhabi tour a few a few days ago, and they had listened to our podcast oh, about the Dubai and Abu Dhabi tours, in which you suggested that they should turn it into some kind of wacky races, you know, points race affair. Um, what they have done is announced that those two races are going to be combined next year, and it's going to be a seven day UAE tour. So they didn't like my idea. Um, no, Lionel. Um, no, hmm. I don't think you'll be invited next year just just to just to return briefly to to the latest friends special to become a friend of the podcast go to the cyclingpodcast.com it costs 15 pounds for the year and uh, by signing up you will get exclusive episodes like this one there's a few more in the pipeline um, and you will also be supporting us and everybody who's signed up so far thank you very much we're very grateful we should also mention um, because we haven't mentioned it for a couple of weeks our book our journey through the cycling year with uh, diaries from all of us at the three grand tours and other chapters as well that is available at all the usual outlets and uh, thank you very much for your feedback on that so far um, please keep it coming uh, we want to know what you think and as we've got uh, the Grand Prix Haubecker coming up on Friday get Wevelgem on Sunday and Dwarves of London and next Wednesday it's actually moved dates uh, Dwarves of London and it's a week later uh, so it falls between Ghent Wevelgem and the Tour of Flanders this year. Um, but uh, if you didn't sign up as a friend of the podcast last year, um, that's still available. It's £10 for all of those episodes. Loads of stuff, including loads of bonuses. But more pertinently and relevant to this week, if you haven't heard it, my series, which um, we called The Lionel of Flanders, where I went to those three Belgian races and kind of uh, made an episode a day for five days, um, still available and you know hopefully we'll v- be voted voted the best uh, friend special it was, uh, it was offering of last year it, I believe Lionel it, wasn't it it was yeah I spent a lot of time well you, I spent you a, reminded me of that you reminded me of that this morning well, I spent I spent two or three days solidly voting for it um, in, in, the read, <laughs> in the listener survey so uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um, we heard about uh, Gaviria's uh, um, fondness for mowing the grass there in that little clip from our friend special. He was missing from Milan San Remo, of course, and we had been speaking a lot in the last few weeks about the the quick step, you know, threat at Milan San Remo. It didn't really didn't really materialise, did it? Philip Gilbert had a problem. Their best rider, uh, you know, uh, having having at one point had four options to win the race, they ended up best result nineteenth. Elia Viviani, very disappointing. Very one of their for them. one of their worst ever monument performances, but mm. I would suggest that you know that that doesn't mean that they're going to have an awful spring. They they tend to bring it or pull it round at, at some point, don't they? The other the other bad luck story from the race. Well, Andre Greipel had been looking extremely good actually, and and you know very very strong, and he has always threatened to ride really well in, in the classics. You know even Tour of Flanders and, and races like that. And so he's going to sit those out this year, which is a great shame at his age. You know, he he is a, a fading force, isn't he? As as we said about 10 years ago. Um, but Mark Cavendish, uh, what a dreadful start to the season. He's having three really bad crashes. I mean, not just crashes, but um, bad crashes. The first one, okay, it was a, a slow speed, but he, he obviously um, suffered concussion there the second one the team time trial at Terreno Adriatico on day one that was a nasty one his face was bashed up this was the worst of the lot it certainly looked the worst of the lot um I mean when you saw it, it, it you you know it was just awful to watch and and you, you feared for him the injuries don't seem to have been that bad remarkably a broken rib another broken rib um, but Daniel, have you heard from Cavendish? How is he? What sort of mood is he in after that? Yeah, I, I um, spoke to him briefly or exchanged messages with him on Saturday night, so uh, on the day of the race, and he was okay. He was in pretty good spirits. Um, he hurt his ankle. I think he broke another rib. Um, he, he wasn't talking yet about when he we would we will uh, see him back in action. But um, he was he was already, I think, feeling pretty beaten up. Certainly in his morale um, before Sam Ramos so after those f- first two crashes this year the one in Abu Dhabi and Tirreno and the one in Tirreno was well, it had sort of mechanical causes the, um, I think he went over a speed bump and um, yeah the, it, 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 I think his, his 
bike took some of the impact and he came off. Um, and yeah, I think he, he sort of resents and is worried that th- this image is is growing and is spreading of him as someone who is very accident prone and who crashes a lot. O- obviously, after the Tour de France last year when he crashed out in that now infamous collision with Peter Sagan. Um, so, you know, he has had these four crashes now since well including that one at the Tour de France and um you know he he doesn't feel that that really represents his his riding style or how he um usually goes about his business and and he was also very much looking forward to this season having had a really good winter and and even after those two setbacks early in the year on Saturday at Milan San Remo he sort of counted himself out he told Dimension Data his team that um, he they didn't need to work for him on Saturday he would work for for other riders and um, but he was feeling fantastic on Saturday so he got over the Chipressa in good shape and they were coming towards the Poggio and um, he he sort of regretted at that point. Um, having told the team not to work for him. Um, but, you know, I, I, there's enough time before the Tour de France to him, for him to get his season back on track. But, of course, it's the last year of his contract with Dimension Data as well, which which brings another layer of, of anxiety and, and angst. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, Cavendish, Greipel, both both ruled out. Had they been there and had they survived the Poggio, again, it could have been a different outcome, you know, with couple of extra bodies there. You don't know. I, I don't know off the top of my head how many teammates they might have had there. I think Greipel still had a few. Um, you know, again, that that might have been a factor in, in Nibali holding off holding off the the rest of them. Yeah, on Cavendish. Um, while we were on our book tour around the country a week or so ago, we were asked a couple of times whether we thought Mark Cavendish would equal Eddie Merckx's record of stage wins at the Tour de France. Merckx, of course, is on 34. Well, he's, he's, he's declared on 34. Let's face it, he's, he's not He's not going to add a 35th, is he, Eddie Merckx? And le- unless, uh, he, it's, un- it's unlikely. Unless he fancies coming out of retirement to uh, an honorary start at the at the Tour next year in, uh, in Brussels. Um, Mark Cavendish is on 30. And, um, you know, we've, we've wavered one way or the other whether he would be able to draw level or perhaps even surpass that record. I mean, for the first thing, there was there were so many more split stages back in Merckx's day and a lot of his wins were also time trials. And, of course, he could win uh, on the flat in the mountains. So, you know, it's not really comparing like for like, but it is the out, the outright record. Um, I don't know. The, these, this terrible early season, you know, whether... Whether you believe in kind of luck or not, um, you have to feel that that, that Cavendish's luck cannot continue um, to be this bad uh, going forward. You know, he should be due a, a, a more lucky break um, at some point. So who knows? I mean, he's got plenty of time to uh, get into really good shape for the Tour de France. And um, you never know. You wouldn't write him off and, and and put a couple of stage wins past him this year. And then once he's within two, um, it, it might be possible. But if you had to... Well, something we always overlook or we don't um, attach enough importance to Napalm is... is- Who's com- who's he competing against? And you know, if there happens to be one rider, one other sprinter who's uh, you know who's um, absolutely flying when the Tour de France comes around, and it becomes a whole lot harder. But it, just looking at the uh, Hodgie, well, Hodgie, Hodgie, I don't think Hodgie will be doing the Tour this year. But um, <laughs> just looking at the uh, the sprinters who are likely to be at the Tour de France, you know, Kittel, um, although he was obviously dominant last year in the in the sprints at the Tour, um, uh, he I would suggest that he's never quite. Um, established an impregnable sort of um, stranglehold of of the sprinting throne. There is, he's always he, he always gives his rivals some some sort of glimmer of hope, and, and we saw that again at Milan San Remo um, at the weekend. Just how vulnerable he is on certain types, of course. Um, the young guns, Ewan, certainly sent a pretty resounding message, although he didn't win on Saturday. That he's incredibly fast and. Gaviria, everyone is talking up, and Cavendish himself is, is, has talked up. But um, there, there are a couple of sort of notes of of caution when it comes to Gaviria. I've heard a couple of people say that he really needs to keep his feet on the floor, um, suggesting that he's someone who you know might struggle a little bit with fame and the kind of ad- adulation that he's going to get in in Colombia. But that's that's obviously speculation. But um, just regarding Cavendish himself, I mean, I said 
at the event when we did get that question that I think he's never better than when his back's against the wall and that he's being written off which happens well regularly now has happened regularly in his career um, and you know I compared it to 2016 which was his last really good season when he went back onto the track and and he went into a world where people were writing him off again on the track they said you know he's been away for a long time he hasn't got enough experience there are guys who are better than him and um, you know he he really thrived in in that environment when when he was being doubted and maybe we're, we're nearing that point again you know as the spring wears on when people are going to start saying well that's it he's finished he's got no chance at the Tour de France and he'll pull something out who knows who knows we better be careful here because in the last couple of weeks we've been uh, accused of talking too much uh, about Mark Cavendish and also of being anti-Mark Cavendish our, our latest iTunes review actually said that we we hate hate Mark Cavendish. Very no, no, I think I think that was saying if you if you if you hate Mark Cavendish, and if you hate Team Sky, then uh, we're that we're the podcast for. No, oh, okay. no, I think I misunderstood. I misunderstood yeah, it. No, it's You've so, obviously been studying it longer uh, than I have. And I, you know, well, I've tried to. Just one I've of tried those to things. unpick it in on six, seven, eight, nine levels. Really, you know. <laughs> To, 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 you know, uh, fuel for the engine, Rich. You know, fuel for the if engine. You wanna, I'm looking forward to the blog on that, Lionel. <laughs> if, you wanna leave, if you wanna leave a positive review on iTunes, by all means, do so. You didn't mention there, Daniel, the atomic tadpole. No, forgot about the atomic tadpole. Who, I think I'm quite who, disappointed. Who, who's got to be the greatest threat. Well, no? yeah, and I was quite disappointed that he didn't have a tilt at Milan Summer. I was quite surprised <coughs> when yeah, some Dutch, strange Dutch. One. Colleagues told me that he wasn't even going to go, and you know, even we said that Kittle didn't particularly impress us in on Saturday. But um, I, I do feel that Kittle has left it too late in his career to really, well, to, to go through four or five of these races of um, San Ramos and and just get the measure of the thing in the same way that Cipollini did, in the same way that to a certain extent Pataki did, um, sort of big powerful sprinters who, with time. Um, actually figured out how to, how to go about it, but Kittle, I think he's oh, is he thirty one now or thirty? I think he's probably left it a bit late. Okay, so Kittle will probably win Milan Sanremo next year. Um, chaps, we should wind things up for this week. Uh, we're looking ahead to the cobbled classics resuming E three. Uh, kicking things off next week we'll have a report from the tour of catalonia which is going on at the moment hannah troop our lady in the desert is there um not very desert like in catalonia but she'll she'll have a dispatch from there next week we look forward to that Uh, in the meantime uh we should wrap things up lionel thank you very much thank you richard daniel thank you thank you you've been listening to the cycling podcast If you enjoyed this episode, please rate us and leave a review on Facebook and iTunes. Just search online for The Cycling Podcast. This episode was edited and produced by Adam Bowie.